So the message this morning I want to talk about, and we're continuing to talk about the letter to the churches of Galatia and how Paul will seeming make his point and give a couple of arguments and then make the point again and give a couple of more arguments and then make the point again and give a couple of arguments. And I think there is a number of reasons you'll sometimes read the commentaries and they'll say that Paul kind of goes in circular fashion. Well, sometimes I think that's appropriate because as there was once a television commercial that said the mind is a wonderful thing to waste, that um, sometimes we need to repeat things over and over and over again in order to finally get that. So I'll kind of give you a couple of examples. Um, How many can write down right now the quadratic formula? If you took, we got a couple of teachers, okay, great. They can do it. It's a good thing because they're teaching math. Um, but I remember back being in the seventh grade and then the, the ninth grade that, you know, they spent like a month on the number line. And my attitude was, if you didn't get that figured out in the first half hour, give up. And then they spent like, a day on the quadratic formula, and guess what was on the test? The quadratic formula. And, but it's one of those things that you don't tend to use and so that you forget. And so, not to just pick on mathematicians, uh, how many know who the 22nd president of the United States was? I'll give you a tip. He was also the 24th president of the United States. We tend to forget things that we don't use frequently, and I think this is one of the reasons why Paul keeps repeating his arguments because we tend to say, okay, that's nice, and go on and not realize that we need to re be reminded again and again. And one of the other things that oftentimes do is that we have to overcome our preconceived notions. I'll give you a, 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 an example in my life of preconceived notion. It's not going to do anything with religion or things like that, but to, to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, my wife uh, took a job several years ago, and you know, as we all do, we would talk about our job and the people in it. And she would talk about her boss and the, the second kind of boss that she had. And in my mind's eye, I had a picture of what that lady looked like. And so every time she would talk about this lady, I would think about what she looked like. And then I met her. She looked nothing like I had thought she would look like. Now you would think, okay, great. Now that you've seen her, you would change. But then for a while, she would talk about this lady and my mental image of what I thought she looked like would always come to mind. And I'd have to say, no, no, that's not what she looks like. And it took several times of seeing this lady before I overcame my preconceived notion. And unfortunately, oftentimes we, because of our culture or whatever, we have these preconceived notions. And the scriptures will tell us contrary to that, but sometimes we'll slip in. And sometimes because of spiritual matters, uh, for instance, Jesus says that when the, when the seed is, is, is attempted to be planted, that sometimes Satan comes and takes those seeds away so people never get an, an understanding. Or sometimes because the burdens or cares of this world, they choke off those things and we go back to our preconceived notions. And so Paul is telling us over and over and over and over and over again that our salvation that our righteousness does not depend on our goodness, on our following the law, but on faith. And so in Galatians chapter 3, he's going to again discuss this. And so he says in verse 1, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before who eyes Jesus Christ was publicly proclaimed or portrayed as crucified? Now what Paul is saying is, when he says foolish, he's not saying you're stupid in the sense of you don't know how to learn. What he's saying is you aren't, you aren't taking the facts and the logic and coming to the correct conclusion. You're being foolish in your, uh, 
mental understanding of what's going on. You're foolish and to such a point that it seems it's almost like you're foolish. You're almost under a spell. There's some reason you're just not getting it. And so you're foolish and somehow you have become deceived because of this. And he's saying, but you got the right start. He isn't saying that Jesus died in front of them. He's saying that the gospel was so presented that what Jesus' death, burial, and, rep- and, and resurrection represented and what it meant, that they had a clear understanding of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and what that meant. So he's going, you started out with this, you understood it, but it's almost like you've been falling under a spell. And then he asks a question, but he never waits for the answer. He says, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? So he's saying, okay, tell me, how did this Holy Spirit come upon you? How is it that he indwelled with you? Did he do that upon your hearing the gospel and and accepting that by faith? Or did you receive the Spirit by keeping a bunch of rules and regulations? He's going to know what the answer is. And the answer is kind of obvious. It's not like, and, and we can do it in our own lives as, as believers. Those of us who are believers, how is it that the Holy Spirit came and dwelt in our lives? Was it because we came to, to Christ and God in faith? Or was it because we kept a bunch of rules and regulations? I have never heard a testimony. Now, maybe someday I may. I doubt it. I've never heard a testimony that says, you know, I was a murderer, and I stopped murdering. And after I stopped murdering, I felt God closer to me. And then I stopped committing adultery, and I felt even closer to God. And then, you know, I stopped lying. Well, until just now, and then I just lied again because I haven't stopped lying. And, you know, I stopped making all of these molten images, and you don't hear anybody saying, I get the Spirit. They may sense of, oh, I feel holy or whatever, or a sense of self-pride, but there isn't a sense of God came to me based on what I did or didn't do. It's, I was a bad guy and God came to me. Or I was a, a little child and, and I was seven years old and, and I heard the gospel and I just, it was right. Those are the things you hear the word of God and you respond. It isn't, oh, I do a bunch of good things or correct things and therefore now I'm this holy person. So Paul's saying, When you became a believer, how did that happen? How is it that the Holy Spirit came to you? And his answer is obvious. It's because you heard it by faith, not by what you did. So then he says, are you so foolish? So he says it again. Okay, your thoughts are foolish. Now is your practice foolish? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And again, the answer to that question is pretty obvious. He's saying, well, wait a minute. If the Holy Spirit came to you, on the basis of faith. He's going to come to you even more boldly because you're following a bunch of rules or regulations? Or is it that you continue to respond in faith to the Word of God? And again, the answer is obvious. They're responding because of the faith in Christ, not by the good works. Then he asked them another question. Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain... He's going, you know, there was persecution, and there is persecution by we Christians. And he's saying, did you suffer these things? Or was it that when you became a believer and people said, you're kind of weird. I, you know, it's, it even happens in today's world. You'll hear somebody who will become a believer, and it's not that he rejects his friends. His friends start to reject him. And suddenly you have less friends than you had before. And so that can be, in an essence, a persecution because now your friends are leaving because they don't seem to understand. So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? So again, he's saying, when God does things, when he sends the Spirit, when he performs miracles, does he do it because of the law abiding or does he do it because of faith? And again, Paul is going to 
assume the correct answer is that God does these things based on faith. If, if that were the case, if God did miracles according to the works of the law, the Pharisees would have been marvelous miracle workers. They didn't go far on the Sabbath. They didn't do these things. They, they, made sure, they not only made sure that they followed the law, they made a bunch of rules and regulations to prevent them from uh, violating the law. So, is it, so the miracle workers, if it was by works of law, ought to be the Pharisees. And guess what? It wasn't. It's a bunch of fishermen who responded in faith to the call of Jesus. And then he's going to argue in the Old Testament the showing that those who hold to the Old Testament teaches that it's not the law that saves you, but faith. And so in verse 6 it says this, Even so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6, and he says, notice it says that he believed God. Didn't say he believed in God. He said he believed God. God had made a promise to Abram. And that promise was that if he could count the stars in the sky, he could number his descendants. And at the time God made that promise, Abram was an old man married to an old woman who was barren. But he believed God. And you see, that's what's faith. Unfortunately, in, in today's culture, oftentimes we don't have faith, we have assumption. There are things that we assume. But God said, this is going to happen, and Abram believed God. So when God makes a promise, Faith is believing what God said, even if all the circumstances seem to indicate it's impossible, because our God is a God of the impossible. And so he says, all of the Pharisees and all the Jews who are prideful of being a Jew look back to two people. The first one he's going to look at is Abram. We are children of Abraham. They were prideful of that. And Paul is saying, Abraham became who he was, not because he followed the law, because quite frankly, he was there 430 years or so before the law came. It was a belief of what God said and accepting that as true. But notice it said it was reckoned to him. It's like, and you've probably heard this before, it's like an accounting ledger. It's debits and credits, and God is saying, I'm going to credit you with righteousness. It's not earned. It's not on the income ledger. It's on what I'm giving you. And the righteousness is not your righteousness. And that's where I think a lot of people start to mit start tweaking on the, well, I got to keep the law. Because the righteousness that is accredited to Abraham and the righteousness that is credited to us who believe is God's righteousness. I can be the most righteous, I can be the most self-righteous person in the room and be totally unrighteous. But when God credits his righteousness to me, I am perfectly righteous. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. John, when he was ministering, again, they were saying, we're proudful that we are the children of Abraham. And John's answer to him was, God can make rocks and turn them into children of Abraham. Don't be so prideful. But it's those who are of faith that are children of Abraham. So in essence, it's not, if you will, the Jew or the Gentile. It's the believer who is the child of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. Again, he's quoting Genesis 12, 3. So that those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Again, he's saying Abraham was righteous because of his belief, because of his faith. 
in acknowledging what God had promised would come to pass. And he's following it up by saying that we are those children when we follow in that belief and faith. And he's saying it was Abraham, not the doer, but the believer. And that we are now, and in essence, Genesis, all the way back to Genesis, acknowledging that it is the Gentile who will be blessed. It's not just one ethnic group. If God is intending to bless the entire world, the nations, through Abraham. Now, after saying the scriptures teach faith, he's going to say, here's the problem with your acceptance of trying to follow the law to perfect yourself or to complete yourself. And he says this, starting with verse 10. For as many are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Paul now quotes Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse, I believe it's 26. I, I commend you to go back and read that chapter. Half the chapter talks about if you do this, if you, if you do this act, you'll be cursed. If you do this act, you'll be cursed. If you do that act, you'll be cursed. If you do this act, you'll be cursed. There's a whole list of cursing. That's not the only chapter in, in the first five books of the, of the Old Testament that talk about it. Before they enter the land, God says to them, if you do all of these things, and lists a whole bunch of things, and each thing he says, you'll be blessed, you'll be blessed, you'll be blessed. Then he turns around and says, if you don't do these things, you do these things, you'll be cursed, you'll be cursed, you'll be cursed. The end of, in essence, Deuteronomy 27 is saying, you got to keep it all. If you don't keep every single command, you're a lawbreaker. It's not as we have our preconceived notions that if the, on this balance of the scale, I have more good works than bad works, somehow that gets me into heaven. In God's economy of justice, you violate one law of the 633, 34 laws that there are. You violate one, you're guilty of them all. And he's saying, if you don't perform them all, if you don't keep them all, you're cursed. Now that's worse than being guilty. So guess what? You're not going to keep all the law. So you're cursed. Then he says, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. It's obvious. And if you think about it, we're not Jewish, and so most of us don't know the 633 or 34 laws that are our, you know, we know some of the big ones like thou shalt not murder. Then Jesus kind of messes that one up by saying if you call somebody a fool, you're guilty, and we're not supposed to commit adultery, but if you look at a woman with lust. And so he, he makes, not only makes it the, the application, but the intent as well. So he makes it even, but even if we just limit it to the, Outside of fairness, let's face it, we know that we don't keep the law. And those of us who don't know the law, we have a law to ourselves. It's called a conscience. God has given us all a conscience. Now, some of us have so violated our conscience or are so evil that that conscience is pretty much dead. But for most of us, when given an opportunity to, to do right or to do wrong, we have that little thing in our head that says, you're supposed to do the right thing. And then we argue with ourselves because, you know, it, it, either because of lack of faith or we need someone. You know, we argue with ourselves and we may end up doing the wrong thing or we may end up doing the right thing. But all of us know that there has been some point in our history of ourselves that we have violated our conscience, not just the law. So if you can't even live up to your own standard, how are you going to live up to God's standard? So Paul is saying, that's the wrong way to go. It is evident, both to the Jew and to the Gentile, we can't be justified. We can't be held guiltless 
by keeping the law. Four, the righteous man shall live by faith. Again, he quotes an Old Testament passage, um, Habakkuk uh, 2.24. He's saying, even back in the Old Testament, it doesn't say, because again, it says over and over, you can't live and be justified by the law. He's saying, the righteous man lives by faith. Again, he doesn't live by assumption. He lives by faith. And the faith is not that there is a God, but that God makes promises and you can depend on them. So we are to live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, for he who practices them shall live by them. The law is the one who says, well, I believe the law says this and therefore I will act. No, the law says thou shalt not or thou shalt and then we're to do it. It's not a matter whether you believe it or not, you just do it. If after attending services today, you get in your car and you drive down the highway at an excessive speed, and whatever that means, I'll let you decide. Some of you, excessive speed means 120. Some of you means 42. Whatever excessive speed is, it's probably higher than what is posted on the the, uh, street sign. Sometimes we think, well, because nobody stopped me, I'm not, I didn't violate the law. You violated the law. If you get caught, your argument isn't, well, you know, I made every stop sign, and, and I watched out, and, and I didn't text, and I hadn't had anything to drink, and I had both hands on the wheel. Well, the police officer and the judge will ask you, but did you exceed X number of miles an hour? And if you're honest, and if you lie, then you violated the law. If, if you're honest, you say, yeah, I did. Well, guess what? You're going to receive punishment in the sense of a fine, or if you really were going fast, reckless driving and in jail. It's not a matter of what I did. It's a matter of what you didn't do. And so it's not a matter of, well, I have faith that I'm driving correctly. It's, did you follow the posted speed limit? It's not a matter of faith. It's a matter of practice. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Again, Paul says, if you don't keep the law, you're cursed. But Jesus, who kept the law, because he hung on a cross, a wooden inch made of a tree, he received the curse that we deserve, that we might be righteous by our faith in him. So Christ exchanged our curse to be cursed, that we might be made righteous. And again, oftentimes we hear people talk about, praise the Lord because Jesus has forgiven me. He's done even more than forgiven you. He has prevented you from receiving that which you're due, the curse of not following the law. He became cursed for us. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So he ends up again saying, we as Gentiles receive the Spirit just as the Jews receive the Spirit, not by the following of the law, but by faith. And that we are children of Abraham, not because of our ethnicity, but because of the belief that we have in Christ. Next week, we'll take a look at why then the law? What was the purpose of the law? And why was it ever, if if the law doesn't justify us, and only faith does, then why don't we start with faith? 
And Paul's going to under, give us understanding of why the law. So it's important. So again, Paul ends up right back where he started with. We are blessed because of faith. We are children of Abraham because of faith. We are children of God because of faith. And keeping the law doesn't make us any more holy or righteous. It's faith. And we are to live by faith. And that's probably one of the reasons why so many churches, people don't want to go. Because what they think they'll hear in church is that you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that. You're not supposed to go to the movies. You can't play cards. You can't dance. You can't this. You can't that. You can't do all these other things. There's all these rules and regulations. And the truth of the matter is, If you do things and don't have faith, according to the Scriptures, big deal. And if you do things and you don't have faith, big deal. The centrality of this gospel is faith in Christ. It's not all the things that you do, whether good or bad, or all the things that you don't do, whether good or bad. It's why do you do them? And he's saying, you don't do the law according to the acts of the law. You don't do that by faith. You live to God according to faith. And so, the next time you hear that preconceived notion in your mind that says, well, if I violate the law, God won't love me. The answer is, God won't not love you because you violated the law, because guess what? We all do. The better question you ought to ask yourself is, why am I going to do or not do this? If I'm going to do this not because of the law, you have the wrong preconceived notion. If you're doing or not doing this because of your love of God and your faith in Him, now you're living according to faith. So I'll give you some examples. The Word of God says that I am to love you as Jesus loves you and gave himself for you. Not only does it say it, Jesus says, this is a new commandment I give you. It's a law. It's a commandment. But I don't love you. And if I do because of the law, it profits me nothing. But if I love you because he loved me and in the response of him loving me, I love you and seek to do what his will is. Then that's, so I do so by faith. I do so by response. And what, is, it's what Paul talked about last time was that I don't live according to the law. I'm dead according to the law, but I live to God. And I do these things and I don't do these things. So then the scripture says, we are to love our enemy. Now you're getting personal, God. You know, loving, loving people who are supposed to love me back, you know, well, maybe that'll work out. Loving people who hate me, I don't know how, what I'm going to get out of that. Guess what? Jesus didn't get a whole lot of, out of loving you. And at the time that he died for you, you were his enemy. We are to respond in faith to the things that he said. And so often, what people hear is, don't do this, don't do that, don't do whatever. And instead, we should say, I do these things because I'm living for God. I have faith in God. And while it may seem that the circumstances would say and dictate, maybe that's not in your best interest, because God has made promises to me, I know that it's in my best interest. And so I can afford to love you whether you love me back because he first loved me. And the love of God will fill up all the love that I ever need.
When God says to do something, we do it. When God says to not do something, we don't do it. Again, not because of the law, but because we're living for him in faith. So, Paul makes this argument again. We are justified. We are made blameless, innocent, based on faith and not works. Don't let this culture, who has no clue of who God is, to tell you what God's all about. The best example of who God is all about is the Son of God. See what he did. See what he said. Follow him. And when he says, I came into the world not to condemn the world, but for those who believe in me might have eternal life. I'm going to listen to him. Not the people who say, well, if you do enough good things that are more than the bad things, then it'll all work out. Because the truth is, there are two ways to get into heaven. Be perfect. None of us, even if we tried to be perfect from this day on, won't be. But even if we were successful, we have a history. So that's not going to get us into heaven because as Jesus said, no one is good but God. So you must be as good as God is. We all fail. No one is justified by works. The second is by faith in Christ. And the amazing thing is, he offers that to everyone. The most vile sinner you can think of and the most innocent child. It's amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once blind. I was once foolish. But now I see. I think clearly because God has told me how to approach him. And when we've been there, 150 billion years. The sound that we will still sing. Amazing grace. So don't let the world tell you. Don't let our preconceived notions tell you. Let the word of God tell you. And as Paul repeats over and over, it's not good enough for us to read As I've heard people say, well, I read the Bible once. That's the problem. It's kind of like the quadratic formula. You don't remember much. But when you read it, and you read it, and suddenly the words on a page aren't the words on a page. It's in here. It dwells within me that I might see clearly who God is. And I might see clearly. As Paul will say in Corinthians, right now we kind of see through a mirror darkly, but there will come a time when we will see him just as he is. And we will only see him by faith.